This video is based on the study by Stuart E. Dreyfus on how skill acquisition is broken down into five stages. However, I am going to translate and outline the benefits in a melee context. I think there are a lot of interesting comparisons to draw. Stage 1 is Novice. Dreyfus tells us the stage is begun with the instructor decomposing the task environment into context-free features that the beginner can recognise without the desired skill. The instructor in this case would either be a friend, teaching you the game or information you found online. Obviously this can vary from person to person. A feature would be something like dash dancing, with one of its main uses being explained as a form of movement. He then goes on to give the student rules for determining actions on the basis of these features, just like a computer following a program. Always dash dance outside the range of your opponent would be a solid rule, considering you know what range means. Hence why you must gain a further understanding of what the term dash dancing is, as playing like a robot won't achieve the results we're looking for. Stage 2. Advanced Beginner Once the student gains further experience with the situation, and using the rules he's learned pertaining to dash dancing, the friend will point out more aspects of the rule, or the student will note this himself. This will be from real situations playing friendlies or a tournament set. Dash dancing is also a good way to disguise your intent, among many others as an example. After seeing a sufficient number of examples, the student learns to recognise these new aspects. Instructional maxims can then refer to these new situational aspects, recognised on the basis of experience, as well as to the objectively defined, non-situational features recognisable by the novice. The advanced beginner will use situational, peach dash attacking, as well as non-situational dash dancing to decide when to move. You will then be able to follow the maxim counter attack when you have successfully avoided a move with dash dancing. The difference between the previous rule and this maxim is that the student needs to have an understanding of the situation beforehand, which he now does. Still, at this stage, learning can be carried on a detached, analytic frame of mind, as the student follows instructions and is given examples. Stage 3 is competence. Within this stage, a competitor will be completely overwhelmed by the amount of situations facing them. With more experience, the number of potentially relevant elements and procedures that the learner is able to recognise and follow becomes overwhelming. At this point, because a sense of what is important in any particular situation is missing, performance becomes nerve-wracking and exhausting and the student might well wonder how anybody ever masters the skill. To cope with this overload, the student must learn through their own perspective what is important to focus on and what must be ignored. In this case, with Melee, we would want to be focusing on broader aspects of the game, as we have come to find they're more effective at this stage. Highlighting fundamental Melee features, neutral, punish, edgeguarding, etc. and ignoring others, multi-shining, pivoting, moonwalking, Restricting ourselves allows us to understand and make decisions more easily. The student still seeks rules and maxims to avoid inevitable mistakes. However, at this stage there are far too many situations and subtleties for the student to be taught. Therefore, they must decide for themselves which perspective to decide to choose for each, even though it might not turn out successful. I think this hits the nail on the head of how many situations are available and how one must learn them. I think this is quite similar to thinking of a situation in your head and coming to several conclusions on how to win in it. Prior to this stage, if the rules do not work, the performer, rather than feeling remorse for his, his or her mistakes, can rationalise that he or she had not been given adequate rules. But because at this stage the result depends on the learner's choice of perspective, the learner feels responsible for his or her choice. Often, the choice leads to confusion and failure but sometimes things work out well and the competent student then experiences a kind of elation unknown to the beginner. We become more responsible for our actions and efforts because we're now thinking for ourselves and making our own outcomes. The player notices he has stage control and the float height his opponent has chosen. He's able to make a fake with his dash dance outside of his opponent's range and counter attack with an appropriate punish. Winning this situation makes the player feel amazing and losing feels like a punch to the gut. But the more emotionally involved we become, the more winning and losing means to us, not just in the general sense, but in succeeding or failing in situations where we've chosen a perspective. It's a new added difficulty we did not experience in the prior stages. 
Dreyfus questions us, but why let learning be infected with all that emotional stress? Why would we want this attached difficulty? He goes on to explain that it's quite the opposite due to another study that heightened emotional value to the subject is actually beneficial to the process. Patricia Benner has studied student nurses at each stage of skill acquisition. She finds that unless the trainee stays emotionally involved and accepts the joy of a job well done, as well as the remorse of mistakes, he or she will not develop further and will eventually burn out trying to keep track of all the features and aspects, rules and maxims that modern medicine requires. In the cases of nurses at least, resistance to involvement and risk leads to stagnation and ultimately to boredom and regression. This is incredibly interesting to me and shows that as humans, the emotional attachment is required to at least conquer past the stage of competency. He continues to outline this with In general, if one seeks the safety of rules, one will not get beyond competence. On the other hand, experiencing deeply felt rewards or remorse seems to be necessary for the performer to learn from examples without rules. He then goes on to explain in a bit more detail about emotional reactions. Of course, not just any emotional reaction, such as enthusiasm or fear of making a fool of oneself or the exultion of victory would do. What matters is taking responsibility for one's successful and unsuccessful choices, even brooding over them, not just feeling good or bad about winning or losing, but replaying one's performance in one's mind step by step or move by move. The point, however, is not to analyse one's mistakes and insights but just to let them sink in. Experience shows that only then will one become an expert. I think taking responsibility is the key phrase here. If you do not do this, you will blame the game or the rules which you followed, even though it has been stated that these are your own decisions at this stage. The interesting part about this personally is how he mentions not to analyse it, but just to let it sink in. This suggests that the feelings and the understanding is more essential to the process rather than the analysis. Stage 4 is proficiency. As the competent performer becomes more and more emotionally involved in a task, it becomes increasingly difficult for him or her to draw back and adopt the detached, rule-following stance of the beginner. If the detached stance of the novice and advanced beginner is replaced by involvement, and the learner accepts the anxiety of choice, he or she is set for further skill advancement. Accepting that dealing with new emotions in regards to your skill of choice will be difficult is an important step, especially to get to the stage of proficiency. The competitor will be able to discriminate between both good and bad situations. These experiences will replace the previous rules and principles and form a much stronger bond. Doing it this way is how proficiency is honed. As the performer acquires the ability to discriminate among a variety of situations, each entered into with involvement, plans are revoked and certain aspects stand out as important without the learner standing back and choosing these plans or deciding to adopt that perspective. Really, this just shows how thought process becomes more natural at this stage and you can do things mostly without thinking. It's very similar to the four stages of competence in my experience. The player is now involved and experienced with the skill. He or she can see obvious goals and important aspects but is unaware of how to achieve them. They require further experience in order to react automatically. As I mentioned, the thought process is now more natural, but there is still thinking involved and the player still falls back on rules and maxims. The melee player is now consistently making it to the bracket stage. He or she can notice the opponent's stage position along with many other features. The player has decided that it is time to approach, but he or she must still decide in the best way to do so. In comparison to the competent melee player, the proficient player will have less time to think about it and make this decision more quickly. Stage 5 is Expertise. The expert is immersed in the game and can see what needs to be done. Along with deciding how to do it, the player understands what needs to be achieved because of his vast knowledge of situations and knows how to instantly achieve this. The difference between the proficient player and the expert is they have learned to distinguish a plethora of situations, broken down further into subclasses allowing them to immediately react to any situation. This is the characteristic of expertise. The player can now grab his or her opponent and follow up with the optimal punish previously arranged. What must be done simply is done, without considering the previous neutral exchange as it's already played out as planned. 
the goal of the matchup are clearly understood from their perspective and are achieved through the player's decisions. Dreyfus educates us again with an interesting anecdote. A few years ago, we performed an experiment in which an international master, Julio Kaplan, was required to add numbers presented to him audibly at the rate of about one number per second, as rapidly as he could, while playing a five second and move chess against a slightly weaker but master level player. Even with his analytical mind completely occupied by adding numbers, Kaplan more than held his own against the master in a series of games. Deprived of the time necessary to see problems or construct plans, Kaplan still produced fluid and coordinated play. Kaplan's performance seems somewhat less amazing when one realises that a chess position is as meaningful, interesting and important to a professional chess player as a face in a receiving line is to a professional politician. Almost anyone could add numbers and simultaneously recognise and respond to familiar faces, even though each face will never exactly match the same face seen previously. And politicians can recognise thousands of faces, just as Julio Kaplan can recognise thousands of chess positions similar to ones previously encountered. I think this brings home the point that when the player is at an expert level, it will come entirely naturally. He further embodies this point with, but normally an expert does not calculate, he or she does not solve problems, he or she does not even think, he or she just does what normally works, and of course, it normally works. I think Armada is a great example of this, along with the rest of the top 10. You can see in his gameplay he already understands how to play many situations and is always optimally brutal. You can see he's done the same thing over a thousand times because he's followed the structure. I hope that you find this video interesting and can maybe understand further to where you lie on these stages and how to overcome them. Until next time.